welcome, welcome, discovery learners, to another episode of Ability to Learn. Yes, it is I, Teacher Liz, your host for this evening. For today, the 8th day of October 2020. In today's episode, we are going to learn why the seasons change like magic. Travel to ancient, mysterious lands in witness creatures that hiss and us witches use their venom in our potions mystic trees that have leaves shaped as hearts and learn how to concoct tasty treats we all can make at home let us not delay my pretties let's start the show and now for our daily observances our first observance is National Pierogi Day. On October 8th, National Pierogi Day recognizes an international dish that is a type of dumpling. Pierogi is a plural form of a rarely used Polish word, pierog. These dumplings of dough bring delicious meal to the table. The semi-circular dough is often stuffed with savory fillings before being boiled. After boiling them, cooks will either bake or fry the dumplings in butter to finish cooking them. Some pierogies are filled with mashed potato filling, potatoes and cheese, or potatoes and onions, or just cheese, cabbage, sauerkraut, ground meat, mushroom, or spinach and fruit. Other pierogi servings include melted butter, sour cream, fried bacon crumbles, sauteed mushrooms, onions, or green onion. Mmm, sounds good. The dessert variety are those filled with fruit fillings and can be enjoyed topped with applesauce, maple syrup, chocolate sauce, or whipped cream. There are other similar types of dumpling-like dishes in other ethnic cuisines. Eastern European immigrants popularized pierogi in the United States. At first, immigrants served pierogi to only their families. However, ethnic restaurants also serve pierogi. After World War II, ethnic churches sold pierogi as a staple fundraiser. By the 1960s, grocery stores marketed pierogi for the frozen food aisles in many parts of the United States. In fact, grocery stores still sell them today. So how do you observe National Pierogi Day? Well, while preparing dinner, make some pierogi, and then invite your friends to try the pierogi. Pause here, so you can write down the recipe to make pierogi at home. I've never had a pierogi, but they seem similar to a empanada. Have you ever had one and did you like it? Let me know in the comment section below. Our next observance is National Depression Screening Day. Roughly 40 million adults in the U.S. struggle with depression or anxiety, not to mention the family, friends, and co-workers that are also impacted. National Depression Screening Day is held annually on October 8th and it's important for many reasons. First, it can help people make an informed diagnosis. It also drags depression out of the darkness and perhaps most importantly, it can bring help to those that need it. So how do we observe National Depression Screening Day? First, learn something new. For those suffering symptoms, use National Depression Screening Day as a chance to learn how to manage them. For those who do not suffer from depression, learn how to help someone else. Two, reach out to somebody. Most people probably know someone suffering from depression. Reach out to them and let them know that you support their battle. Three, contribute to the fight. Whether or not you suffer from depression, use this day to fight back. Learn about volunteering opportunities or just write a Facebook post about the battle against depression and let others know that you understand and care. Our last observance is National Fluffer Nutter Day. Some of you are probably saying, what the heck is a fluffer nutter? Well, it's a sandwich, a peanut butter sandwich. But more than just a peanut butter sandwich, it also has marshmallow. That's what a fluffer nutter is, a marshmallow and peanut butter sandwich. National Fluffer Nutter Day on October 8th brings about a yummy and extraordinary combination. Some holiday foods are stickier than others, and National Fluffer Nutter Day is a stick to your ribs, chin, fingers, nose kind of day. Celebrate zealously, then take a bath. <laughs> Cause you know, it's, it gets everywhere and it's sticky. Anywho, so how do you observe Fluffernutter Day? 
by layering all the creamy goodness of marshmallow cream and the sweet dry taste of peanut butter between toasted bread. Yes, you celebrate it by making your own fluffernutter sandwich. You know who else famously ate a fluffernutter sandwich with bananas? Elvis. He loved fluffernutter sandwiches with banana slices. I also hear you can eat it with bacon or chocolate. Make a fluffer nutter s'more sandwich. Hey, the sky's the limit. Have you ever tried a fluffer nutter? Do you like it? Leave your answers in the comment section below. On this day in history. Today, in 1871, the Great Chicago Fire started in a barn by a cow knocking over a lantern. The Great Chicago Fire was a conflagration that burned the American city of Chicago during October 8th to October 10th, 1871. The fire killed approximately 300 people, destroyed roughly 3.3 square miles of the city, and left more than 100,000 residents homeless. The fire began in a neighborhood southwest of the city center. A long period of hot, dry, windy conditions and the wooden construction prevalent in the city led to the conflagration. The fire left the south branch of Chicago River and, and destroyed much of central Chicago. The fire is claimed to have started about 9 p.m. on October 8th. In or around a small barn belonging to the O'Leary family, the shed next to the barn was the first building to be consumed by the fire. City officials never determined the exact cause of the blaze, but the rapid spread of the fire due to a long drought in the prior summer, strong winds from the southwest, and rapid destruction of water pumping systems explain the extensive damage of the mainly wooden city structures. There has been much speculation over the years on the single start to the fire. The most popular tale blames Mrs. O'Leary's cow, who allegedly knocked over a lantern. The fire spread was aided by the city's use of wood as a prominent building material in a style called balloon frame. More than two-thirds of the structures in Chicago at the time of the fire were made entirely of wood. All of the city sidewalks and many of the roads were also made of wood. In 1871, the Chicago Fire Department had 185 firefighters with just 17 horse-drawn steam pumpers to protect the entire city. The initial response by the fire department was quick, but due to an error by the watchmen, the firefighters were sent to the wrong place, allowing the fire to grow unchecked. These factors combined turn a small barn fire into a citywide conflagration. Help flowed into the city from near and far after the fire. The city government improved building codes to stop rapid spread of future fires and rebuilt rapidly to those higher standards. Today, in 1957, the Brooklyn Dodgers announced their move to Los Angeles. On May 28, 1957, National League baseball owners voted unanimously to let the Brooklyn Dodgers and the New York Giants move to California. The teams had to move together or not at all, and by October 1957, both had announced their moves. It overjoyed West Coast baseball fans and left broken hearts that still haven't mended in New York City. With most modern day team moves, what happened with the Dodgers and the Giants came down to money, new stadiums, and fan support. The Dodgers were one of the most beloved and well-supported teams in baseball history. They routinely outdrew their cross-city rivals, the Giants. Their other cross-city rivals, the New York Yankees, had beaten them in the World Series in 41, 47, 49, 52, and 53. The Dodgers finally broke through in 1955, beating the Yankees in the World Series, although they lost again in 1956. By the time 1957 rolled around, the team had given the fans a World Series title and seven pennants in the past 16 years. They had also broken the color barrier by signing on Jackie Robinson in 1947. Because of so many years of coming close but not winning the title, the slogan, Wait Till Next Year, was born in Brooklyn. But that was all about to end. As the Dodgers officially announced their move on October 8, 1957. Wow, pretty interesting. I know a lot of you may be Angels fans, but do any of you like the Dodgers? Or if not, what's your favorite baseball team? Let your answers be known in the comment section below. Today, in 1971, John Lennon's second solo album, Imagine, is released in the UK. 
Lennon began writing the song while still a member of the Beatles at the time, when the band had achieved unprecedented popularity but struggled to cope with their new reality. The song's idealistic, utopian lyrics were heavily influenced by John Lennon's wife, the conceptual artist Yoko Ono. He would later assert that the lyric and concept were straight out of Grapefruit, a book of poetry by Ono, and she officially received joint writing credit in 2017. A little over a year after the Beatles broke up, John Lennon recorded Imagine in a single session at his and Ono's country estate in Tiddenhurst Park with producer Phil Spector. Unlike any other Lennon releases from that era such as Give Peace a Chance, Power to the People, and Happy Xmas, War is Over, the song did not contain any overt political messages. Nonetheless, the famous lyrics, Imagine all the people sharing all the world. I'm pretty sure all you smart cookies get the idea. Those lyrics specifically embodied a radical utopian vision as well as the desire of Lennon and many others for the end of the Vietnam War and a return to optimistic humanism that defined much of the previous decade. The song and the album was a massive success, ultimately the most commercially and critically successful of Lennon's solo catalog. Particularly in the light of Lennon's assassination in 1980, Imagine has become associated with both idealism and struggle. I really like this John Lennon song, it's probably my favorite, but he isn't my favorite Beatle. That spot is reserved for Paul McCartney. When the Beatles broke up, Paul McCartney made up a band called Wings. I also like their music too. So who's your favorite Beatle? Let me know in the comment section below. Notable figures born on this day. Our first notable figure is Jesse Jackson, born October 8, 1941, in Greenville, South Carolina. Jesse Jackson is an American civil rights activist and Baptist minister who was candidate for Democratic presidential nomination in 1984 and 1988. He also served as a shadow U.S. Senator for the District of Columbia from 1991 to 1997. He turns 79 this year. Happy birthday, Jesse! Our next notable figure is R. L. Stein, born October 8, 1943, in Columbus, Ohio. R. L. Stein is an American author who is best known for his Goosebump series. His other horror fiction series include Fear Street, Mostly Ghostly, and Nightmare Room books. He turns 77 this year. Happy birthday, R. L. Stein! Our last notable figure is Sigourney Weaver, born October 8, 1949 in New York City, New York. This American actress is very well known for playing the resourceful action hero Ellen Ripley in the Alien film franchise. She also played Diana Barrett in Ghostbusters and Ghostbusters 2, and Dr. Grace Augustine in Avatar. She has also been dubbed the queen of sci-fi movies. She turns 71 this year. Happy birthday, Sigourney! Come along, Discovery Learners, and we will see the landmarks of the world. Today, as we continue our journey of discovery throughout Nepal, here's new landmarks you should know about. The first one is located in Kathmandu, the capital city of Nepal. This city is known for having huge stupas in the city Old Town Square. The Hindu stupa is decorated with prayer flags and has spots Buddha eyes. Whoa, pretty cool. Next is Lumbini. This town is said to be a birthplace of Buddha Siddhartha Gautama, who was born here in 623. Here you can see the Maya Devi Temple. And finally, Bhaktapur. Here you can visit the Shingu Narayan, which is the oldest temple in Nepal. The temple dates back to 464 AD and is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Hey, this is actually the place where you could find the peacock window. It's the same exact city. One of Nepal's highest and biggest 
landmarks is Mount Everest. It's actually Nepal's highest mountain. Mount Everest, the world's highest peak with 8,844 miles or 29,028 feet high. Mount Everest is named after Sir George Everest. In the Nepali language, the mountain is called Sigarmatha, which means forehead of the sky. And by the local Sherpas of the mountain is referred to as Chomoluma, which means goddess mother of the world. Nepal is an older country and there is a lot to see and not enough time to cover it all. But what we've seen so far is pretty cool. What do you think of Nepal's landmarks? Let me know in the comment section below. Here's the animal of the day. Today the animal is the king cobra. King cobras are impressively venomous, large snakes native to Asia. They're called king cobras because they can kill and eat other cobras. Yikes. A fully grown king cobra is yellow, green, brown, or black. They usually also have yellowish or white crossbars or chevrons. The belly may be uniform in color or oriented with bars. The throat is light yellow or cream colored. Juveniles are jet black with yellow or white crossbars on the body and tail. The king cobra is regarded as a fierce and aggressive snake, and its length and size give it an awe-inspiring appearance. The king cobra's deadly fangs are almost 0.5 inches long. Because they are fixed to the upper jaw, they have to be short. If they were longer, they would penetrate the floor of its mouth. Angled back into the snake's mouth, the fangs help push the prey on its path down to the stomach. The average size of a king cobra is about 10 to 12 feet. It can also reach lengths of 18 feet. Ay ay ay, that is big snake. King cobras usually live in northern India, east to southern China, including Hong Kong, and east western Indonesia and the Philippines. They prefer streams in dense or urban forests, bamboo thickets, adjacent to agriculture areas and dense mangrove swamps. The eyesight of the king cobra is better than most snakes. It's good enough to see moving person almost 330 feet away. The cobra's hiss is much lower than most snakes, more like a dog's growl. Although the king cobra is undoubtedly a very dangerous snake, it prefers to escape unless it's provoked. Despite its aggressive reputation, the king cobra is actually much more cautious than many other smaller snakes. The cobra only attacks people when it's cornered in self-defense or to protect its eggs. Throughout its entire range from India to Indonesia, the king cobra causes fewer than 5 human deaths a year, about one-fifth as many as caused by rattlers in North America. And like I said earlier, its bite is very venomous. One bite delivers enough neurotoxins to stun the prey's nervous system within minutes, especially neurosystems that are in charge of breathing. Yikes, these snakes don't seem pretty friendly. I used to own a snake but it was a python. I would never consider owning a cobra. Despite them being vicious, they're kind of cute and I like their scales. What do you think of the king cobra? Let your answers be known in the comment section below. The plant of the day. Today's plant is the Bodhi tree or the Bodhi fig tree, also called the tree of awakening. The Bodhi tree was a large and ancient sacred fig tree, also called the Bodhi tree, located in Boy Goya, Bihar, India. The Bodhi tree is recognizable by its heart-shaped leaves, which are usually prominently displayed. The Bodhi tree is in the fig or mulberry family. It is also known to originate in India and Nepal. The sacred fig is considered to have religious significance in three major religions oriented in Indian subcontinent, which are Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. Siddhartha Gautama, the spiritual teacher who became known as the Buddha, is said to have attained enlightenment or Bodhi circa 500 BCE under the Bodhi tree. In religious iconography, the Bodhi tree can grow up to 98 feet tall, with a trunk diameter up to 9 feet wide. The leaves are heart-shaped, with a distinctive extended drip tip. They can range about 3 to 6 inches wide, and 8 to 12 inches long. One good thing to know about Bodhi trees is that they live a very, very long time. Their average age span could go up to 900 to 1500 years. 
Some trees have been reportedly found living as long as 3,000 years. Wow, that's a really long time. That's pretty interesting. What do you think of the Bodhi tree? Leave your answers in the comment section below. And now for the word of the day. Today's word is Namaste. It's an exclamation. It means a respectful greeting when giving a Namaskar. The next word is Namaskar. It's a noun. It means a traditional Indian greeting or gesture of respect made by bringing the palms together before the face or chest and then bowing. Namaskar. Let's take a look at the art of the day. Our first work of art is the Sand Mandala. The Sand Mandala is a Tibetan Buddhist tradition involving the creation and destruction of mandalas made from colored sand. A sand mandala is ritualistically dismantled. Once this has been completed and its accompanying ceremonies and viewing are finished to symbolize the Buddhist doctrinal belief in the transitory nature of material life. Historically, the mandala was not created with natural dyed sand, but with granules of crushed colored stone. In modern times, plain white stones are grounded down and dyed with opaque inks to achieve the same effect. The monks use a special, extremely dense sand in order to limit interference by things like wind or sneezes. Before laying down the sand, the monks assign the project to draw the geometric measurements associated with the mandala. The sand granules are then applied using small tubes, funnels, scrapers called chakpur until the desired pattern over top is achieved. Sand mandalas traditionally take several weeks to build due to the large amount of work involved in laying down the sand in such intricate detail. It is common that a team of monks will work together on a project, creating one section of the diagram at a time, working from the center outwards. Now remember, once the mandala is finished, it is destroyed. The destruction of the sand mandala is also highly ceremonial, even the deity's syllables are removed in a specific order, along with the rest of the geometry until the last mandala has been dismantled to show impertinence. The sand is collected in a jar, which is then wrapped in a silk and transported to a river to spread the holy blessings of the sand mandala. Our next work of art is the Peacock Window. The Peacock Window is located in the city of Bhaktapur in Nepal. The peacock window is hand-carved out of wood and is a form of traditional Nepalese architecture. What that means is it was mainly done when decorating or building houses. It was the preferred style way back then. These types of windows are called UR windows. UR window refers to the elaborately carved wooden window which is a distinguishing feature of the traditional Nepalese architecture. The ornate windows have been described as a symbol of UR culture and artistry. The level of design and carving of the UR window reached its peak in the mid-18th century. They are found on palaces, private residences, and sacred houses across the Nepal Mandala. The lintel, sill, and jam are ornamented with figures of deities, mystical beings, dragons, peacocks, auspicious jars, and other elements. The window is surmounted by ritual parasols. Traditional Newar houses are usually four stories and built of brick. Different types of windows are used for each floor according to their function. Newar windows are a bare brick facade in the traditional style of making a comeback as an architectural trend due to tourism industry and growing heritage awareness. The peacock window is pretty neat, and all the detail that it was made into the wood carvings is pretty amazing. What do you think of the peacock window, Discovery Learners? Leave your answers in the comment section below. Here is today's interesting fact. Did you know the fall season is caused by the Earth's tilt and not by our distance from the sun? It's true. The cycle of seasons is caused by Earth's tilt on its axis and the planet's orbit around the sun. When the axis points towards, towards the sun, that hemisphere experiences summer. The hemisphere tilted away from the sun experiences winter. After Earth travels a quarter away around the sun, 
the axis is pointed along the Earth's path parallel to the star. From our perspective here on Earth, the Sun travels along an imaginary line called the elliptic, which marks the plane on which the planets orbit around the Sun. Another imaginary line is celestial equator, which is a projection of Earth's equator into space. For half the year, during summer, the northern hemisphere and the Sun appears to move along the elliptic north of the celestial equator. During the other half of the year, it appears to be south of the celestial equator. The exact moment when the Sun appears to arrive at the intersection of the elliptic and the celestial equator is when autumn begins. At Earth's equator, the Sun is directly overhead at noon. These moments in time are called equinoxes. And the length of daylight and nighttime are approximately the same time. The word equinox is derived from two Latin words, equus equals equal, and nox meaning night. So what does that all mean? Well, we live in the northern hemisphere. When the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun, we have summer. When we are tilting away from the sun, we have winter. Autumn, or fall, is a cooling period between summer and winter. Same as spring. Spring is a warming period between winter and summer. So yeah, the change of seasons, especially fall, is caused by the Earth's tilt. Pretty interesting, huh? Okay everyone, set your timers and watches because it's time for 60 seconds of science. Today on 60 seconds of science, we're going to learn about the bones in your arm. More specifically, the forearm. The forearm contains two bones, the radius and the ulna. The radius and the ulna are long, slightly curved bones that lay in parallel to the elbow where they articulate with the humerus to the wrist, where they articulate with the purples. The radius is located laterally near the thumb, and the ulna medially near the little finger. The radius and the ulna have styloid process at the distal end. They are also attachment size for many muscles. The radius is smaller than the ulna. And just so you know, the word articulate in this sense means movement. So to recap, your radius is thumbs up, your ulna is pinkies out. The bone that connects your radius and your ulna to your shoulder is called a humerus. But that's a lesson for another day, as we are out of time. I'll see you back here for another segment of 60 Seconds of Science on Monday and Thursday. Ah, the creatures of the night, what beautiful music they make. We have arrived to the end of the episode of Ability to Learn. I hope you had fun, but not only had fun, but learned something as well. This is Teacher Liz signing out. Farewell, Discovery Learners. I will see you next time. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you're notified when a new video is posted because a video a day keeps the boogeyman away.